Hello, everyone. This is your main host, Rudolf Barish, is back again with another episode. And for today's show, I have a very special guest joining me. He is a Bulgarian patriot, and we have done a few shows. I have been on his show actually a few times, and he goes by the name of Nordlux, and I want to welcome him to my show. Welcome, Nordlux. How is everything with you? Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me, and uh, здравей, брати. Uh, uh, so, well, where, from where to start? I mean, there were a lot of things to be said. Maybe like introduction? Yes, um, well, but, you know, I mean, give the audience when they tune in. We're going to have a fantastic show, you and I. Uh, we can take it on from there, for instance. Uh, just give give the people, you know, where they can find you and so on, and then a short introduction, and then we will also elucidate on the topics that you and I will discuss. Go ahead. Yeah, so basically I'm Bulgarian, let's say racially oriented nationalist. Uh, I had a quite long experience with, uh, in a real uh, life nationalism and being part of different nationalists and uh, let's say more right-wing national nationalist organizations since my late teen years so basically at the last year of the high school and then in the university uh, being quite active in different uh, as I said uh, real-time nationalism mm-hmm. uh, like uh, took part in different elections and uh, campaigning for different uh, things that uh, as we we saw it back in the time will benefit the Bulgarian nation or uh, will benefit in the larger scale the Europeans like the European race including okay. different uh, uh, different uh, how to say congresses for for white nationalists or, or racial nationalists or ethno nationalists it depends how you look at the, the things uh, then after 2010 became less and less active let, let's say because i was disappointed from the move of the idea of the nationalist movement i started to think that uh, the nationalists will start to to maybe organize on a local level and uh, take a direct action. And then with the whole uh, the whole uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine, I, I started to become more and more aware that some kind of end game for Europe and maybe for the European race is coming. Exactly. And, and I want to fill in, uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Did you? Did you wanted to add something? The, 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 they will say that in 2016 I was part of these voluntary border patrols that uh, we were trying to stop this invasion in the in Bulgaria and uh, in of course in Europe, uh, which we were not helped by the authorities in any way. Actually, we were prevented in many cases by by the Bulgarian authorities because they were concerned that uh, our guys were a little bit rough on the invaders mm-hmm. so basically this is and uh, then i've started to i've realized that uh internet is the new the new battleground that maybe i must start to, to engage especially around the trump elections i was quite pissed off by by my friends including in the united states that they didn't realize at that point that Trump obviously is not our guy, is not the savior of of the America, and it definitely is not the friend of the Europeans. So that's why I started to think that we must, our position must become more clear, especially because of things that we we discussed in the previous. Uh, podcast that the Russian narrative is 
quite popular. The Serbs being uh, like a subdivision of the Russians almost. They, yeah. their, their ideas are quite popular. And all these strange globalists like, like Dugin is, like four position is, like these people that are passing to, through the national circles, like, like some kind of traditionalists, but actually they're radicals. They, they're more like dis- destructors of traditionalism. And so that's it. So that, no, I, 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 I have channel on Odyssey, which is the only place that is not censored enough, in my opinion. And, yeah. So people can find you on Odyssey. That's great. And I will put the link in the description so new people can tune in. Yes. Well, I must say I am very amazed by, by your work. And I like this. We have this good regional connection. I'm of Croat origin and you live in Bulgaria too. So yeah. we have many historical connections there too, especially w- which we have discussed in the past. And um, I'm also very amazed by the fact that you have identified that, that this dissident right or this all right is shifting toward a pro-Russo perspective now, especially in this, this was so evident during the 2014 Russian in, invasion of Ukraine. But even before that, when we had the Balkan war in when Yugoslavia crumbled to pieces, between, uh, for instance, when the war started between Serbs and Croats and so on. So, and we see also these old right is shifting more, you know, being very benign towards Serbian, you know, nationalism uh, or Serbian irreditism that I like to call it. So you have really touched on this and done an amazing work. And the second thing that I would also give you credit for is that you actually took part in, in, in activism you know, where you, you, it was so evident, you know, we had these people coming in from Turkey and so on, and they wanted to, to cross this route into Europe. And you were active with, with other Bulgarian patriots too, and you took things into your own hands, which is a huge respect because the authorities are just simply passively, you know, looking when this is happening. And this was naturally in the aftermath of this refugee crisis. So I give you that. So you, uh, you have done tremendous work and I'm very, very happy to have you on. So yeah, I think the show would be great. I think uh, there are so many you know, topics to discuss, but w- what is important that I wanted to bring is that what you bring to the table is also uh, ethnic, racial, uh, racially con- consciousness, let's say, identity when it comes to national nationalism patriotism and this is also good so you can you know touch a little bit on this you have, and and we will go through also these recent events that happened like we see now there are more refugees coming into europe for instance and and many people in the mainstream media are talking about oh we're going to have a new you know, migrant crisis, like they call it. And, um, and, and we see this happening. Now, give me your perspective a little bit of, about what I said, how, how you view it from a racial, racially consciousness, uh, let's say, mindset, and, and also what you think about these recent events now happening in Europe everywhere. Go ahead. So the people must understand that there is a certain biological component of the culture. There is a certain biological component of the of the spirit, so to say. Obviously, I had uh, I, I've uh, told you that that I had a critics to one of your guests, even though I agree with a lot of uh, his positions on the communists and uh, the communist uh, uh, eventual takeover of United States and the world. Well, he called them communists, but we know that uh, they are not only communists in a in a like traditional Marxian sense. <clears throat> they are from certain special tribe, which I won't mention because right. But <clears throat> uh, the thing is that the the thing is that there are definitely large differences between sweet and Congolese and between Congolese and Chinese 
and of course the suppression differences of course that nordic suppress and the different sure. suppress of the balkans but still we are ch children of europe we spiritually culturally and racially are closer together than and genetically you can look at the map, uh, map of, of of the different couple groups and generally speaking uh, europeans are closer together than the middle easterners and then the the sub-saharan africans so obviously obviously for example you you are from uh uh, uh croatian uh or partly croatian uh, extraction but you integrate quite well in the nordic society of the swedes mm -hmm. obviously um i i yeah. have friends in germany and my suspicion is that if someday something happened that I decided to move to Germany. I don't have this intention, but if I decided I will, I will find my place in Germany. Uh, these people, vice versa, these uh, people that from uh, uh, Western Europe are coming to Bulgaria and to the Balkans, they also could integrate quite well because generally speaking, we have similar cultures and we also have similar racial uh, Just, background right. yeah and yeah yeah genetic traits and so on we we share a same gene pool yeah. within Europe and so on so i agree here too and and of course and then this is often a highly controversial topic and i don't it, it shouldn't be because <clears throat> You have this movement, what we have noticed, like the only, let's say, political resistance that we see now is this so-called what the label, what, what the mainstream media labels as the far right. However, these far rightists that the mainstream media is talking about is looking to capture power through parliamentary means are mostly civil nationalist and and they don't talk about let's say ethnic issues like like you and I do because it is considered still controversial but nevertheless it it is it is very sad <clears throat> because like you and I discussed too they believe that we have now moved beyond this let's say racially consciousness agenda that now it's time you you know we have to have a little bit like you said previously we have to have stricter border controls but nevertheless we can there is no racially difference between a mena refugee or an ethnic swede or an ethnic german or an ethnic brit you know pretty much is we all can get along well if they are assimilated into into the same culture so and and of course it, it's how do you view it from that point of view? Like I just said, like if you look at people like Matteo Salvini, if you look at in Sweden, we have this the Sweden Democrats, we have in Germany Alternative for Deutschland, and so on. Uh, any, any, any thoughts on this? Go ahead. I will say that I my my opinion is that it will be quite easy to to to, to be understand from the people on the Balkans. Now, we resisted different invasions for very long period of time. I would say thousands of years. We were on the edge of the different invaders. Some of them were closer to, to our origin. Some of them were tot from, totally from different races. Sometimes we were victorious. Sometimes they were defeated. It is a cycle of history. You cannot be always on the top, unfortunately. But that's why this, that's why the Balkans, the, the, the people in the Balkans, they're much, how to say, they, they develop a specific type of psyche. Uh, these, yeah. these uh, counter, uh, some, some kind of, yeah. of, of, of union around the family and union around the tribe and the values and different, of course, you can say religious values and also, even though I'm not Christian. But, I can mm -hmm. understand. I can understand the, the, the we are sharing more or less the same values. 
in the large extent at least. Uh, so, so these civic nationalists, they're not na natural nationalists. They're just nationalistic sounding liberals. They, like they the, the, even the more kosher nationalists here, they had a certain type of of, of understanding of the of the problems that uh, Western nationalists they don't have. For example, for example, one of the kosher nationalists, even though they will embrace multiculturalism at some point because they're just fake uh, and they are put uh, on the political scene with uh, some kind of of of, uh, of role to, to fulfill some kind of role. But even the, the kosher nationalists in Bulgaria, they uh, uh, one of the statements is that Bulgarians must not be replaced by uh, refugees from the Middle East and Africa. Mm -hmm. And and this this kind of statement is totally unthinkable for the Western nationalists. This will be totally it will be uh, they will think like this is obviously a racist statement. And oh, exactly. And they're yeah. right. It is racist to 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 extent, because it's it's just a struggle for survival. The people they started to lose the understanding of nature. They 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 lost understanding of of history. They think that magically they will replace the Swedes with Congolese or with Sudanese or with Chinese, and they somehow will become Swed Swedish, which is which is obviously it's, this this is mind blowing, and 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 like you said, if you look at the the narrative from the media, which is even more bizarre. For instance, when they talk about these cultural nationalists, or let's say civil nationalists, or whatever you want to call them, they are often described as as white supremacists or racist using the terminology that they want to rule over other races. But never ever is the fact mentioned that maybe, look, people they want to separate from others. Because, for instance, if you look at heavily multiracial countries now, we don't know if, if national, nationalists, let's say true nationalists, will be able to regain power. I'm, I'm primarily thinking of the United States. I mean, it, it might fall under the same category as Brazil or, or possibly as South Africa if, if this continues how it has. And the only way out of this will, will be some some kind of a succession. Uh, and but, but, but any thoughts on this? Because I'm quite amazed by the narrative used. For instance, that they basically they don't single out these nationalists. For, for, from the media point of view, all of them who, who resist this, this massive invasion, well, they're regarded as white supremacists or that they want to rule over other races, when the fact is that they want to live separately from others. <laughs> well, and it, it's all... It, it, well, okay. So basically, the the whole thing is is coming from the r critical racial theory and the European variation of of this uh, poison that is that is spread in America and uh, things like that. Because my suspicion is that, and I'm kind of surprised because Sweden never been really enormous in imperial power. Maybe they had some colonies, but nothing major, nothing like Br British Empire, nothing like or French and Empire, like and nothing like even America. You can look at America like, uh, like imperial power without uh, sure. many colonies. So, so how they were pushing this narrative in Sweden? This is this is the interesting thing for me because honestly, uh, you know uh, that I had friends in Scandinavian countries, in Denmark predominantly, in Norway, uh, and I know some Swedes. Never been very close with with them, but Swedes are kind of different even for the, for the standards of Europe. They, they're a little bit too over the top in in this liberal uh, liberal um, view of the world. 
they're even more liberal than Germans, which means that they are very liberal. I think it has a lot to do with it, for instance, that they were heavily influenced from the social democratic power machinery from the past which wiped out these traditional values and pushed the Swedes into secularization. Now, this functioned pretty well uh, during the 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on, because, I mean, the focus was a lot on, it was a relatively homogeneous society from that era, and you had also a strong industrial sector so Sweden was very progressive in, in economic terms, I would say, in comparison to other countries. However, by the end of the 1970s, Sweden started shifted more towards multiculturalism and the social democrats oh, by the end of the 80s adopted this critical race theory and was also a party of workers in the past. And now it was a party for the petty bourgeoisie, you know, so we shifted. So, so we saw a shift both economically and also, I would say, ideologically too. But I think that is the reason that they have held a hegemony for so long time, the social democrats. And I believe that this makes it very special in their mentality. So, 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 that, so that would be, I would say, the prime reason for this, because I was born and raised in this country, and I have to tell you, when I grew up as a child, it was an amazing country. You know, if you look at the, uh, the labor numbers, the industrial sector, also there were no huge class cleavages. For instance, you know, there was no major difference between a waiter and someone that, that worked within, for instance, that had a, his own company. And now we see totally different. We see much larger class divisions than in the past. You also see that the industrial proletariat is shrinking. I believe it is now statistically 11.5% of the workforce in Sweden. And, and on top of that, we have also enormous pressure for people. They want to enter the country because they still you know, possess a welfare state. However, nowadays, these welfare are very selective. It goes to these migrants and their families and so on. So, so this is an excellent, this is a perfect country. They will be all taken care of in their families if they enter Sweden. So that's why it's a pressure. If you notice that these refugees that, that, that come, into, come into Italy, for instance, and so on, they all want to go to either to, to Sweden or to Germany or to Austria. I mean, where they can take, use these welfare benefits. Any thoughts? Uh, it's, it's interesting. So basically, the, the theory is that the social, how to say, the, the, the economic and social development of Sweden is kind of faster than the spiritual and the the political development if I, I if I can understand it they're very influenced by the American multicultural doctrine well that's one I would say you have two dimensions here one dimension is when the social Democrats in the post-war era took power you have to understand they have um they have held hegemony political hegemony for a very very long time apart from a few governments that shifted over. Uh, but the interesting thing is the Social Democrats, when they came into power, they wiped out all traditional values and they pushed Sweden more towards a secularized secularization. However, this functioned pretty well during, let's say, the industrial era and also in, com in, in regards to that the country was, let's say, racially homogeneous. However, when, when this, let's say, and also the political shift that the Social Democrats took, because in the past, they were very much for the workers' rights, the unions, and so on. But later on, they became uh, a middle party. You know, they adopted the liberalism into, into their realm, too. 
and also critical race theory. And then by the end of the 1970s, in the beginning of the 1980s, all of a sudden, certain powers within the social democrats, they proclaimed that Sweden will become a multicultural society. And one of the key art- architects behind this is a man by the name of David Schwartz, who introduced this in the end of the 1970s. And all of a sudden, the, Sweden, the Swedish Social Democrats, well, they, they said Sweden is now a multicultural society. And by the end of the, let's say in the beginning of the 80s, and especially in the 90s and so on, we have had huge floods of migrants entering. Naturally, we had migrants too. I want to make sure, for instance, like when my parents migrated to to Sweden, but it was a different economic and political landscape at that time because they came here as a labor force to work in the the industries. However, afterwards, the Swedes are, 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 let's say, projecting an image. We have like people's home you know, we can give welfare benefits to the migrants. They actually market themselves as a country that is perfectly suitable for these migrants that they want to, that they know that they can use these benefits and so on. And and Swedes are always inclined towards democracy, human rights, open borders mentality, bringing the people, give them benefits and so on. And this is the most bizarre. And this has hurt the Swedish middle class and the working classes heavily, you know. So, and and naturally, like you said, they're also very influenced by what's happening in the United States and so on. So, So you have that dimension as well, too. So I would say you have a combination of these factors, too. Now, Sweden is not isolated by any means. You have the same phenomenon like like you and I touched upon earlier, for instance, the United Kingdom, <clears throat> you have it in France, definitely Belgium. Belgium is an is an excellent example also of a highly diversified society. You know, so, yeah. Mm, this is interesting. First of all, you said uh, this name, David Schwartz, um, from the special people, I suppose. Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. That, not very surprising, but still. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so we have that connection too. And nobody is talking about this, but yes. So when people can look this up, I mean, I think it's quite fascinating. And we have also, for instance, the media conglomerate, uh, Bonnier News. You know, it's, it's, and, and this is also for people who are maybe not that familiar with it. This is also, a uh, how can I use the language? It's a very strong family that has exercised power for a very, very long time in Sweden. And they have accumulated so much power that they are, they are buying a local newspaper. So they have become the biggest media house in the entire Nordics. So naturally, they are also able to present a certain narrative. And the Swedes, they're like sheep. They read everything from these certain magazines. Yeah. So, so there you have it. So, so the brainwashing process. That uh, is well, very. It's uh, definitely, definitely something is special with the Swedes because I will tell you that the Danes that. My my understanding was that the Danes and all these um, uh, Scandinavian people they were close together and kind of similar in a way. The Danes are laughing at the liberalism of the Swedes, and I'm not saying that Denmark is all these very conservative place and things like that. But just the Swedes are far 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 <laughs> beyond any understanding. One of their what was I... the the foreign minister or the the ministers of interior of Sweden who said that they are uh, humanitarian superpower. With what the fuck means humanitarian superpower? What, what I can elaborate mean? on this. I just I can elaborate on this. Like uh, I, I'm just I'm just gonna give you a brief uh, because I in my work I have worked a lot with the Norwegians and Danes. And, and Finnish people, and naturally Swedes too. What is very interesting is that uh, 
I would say that economically speaking, Sweden was definitely the engine that surpassed all of the other Nordic countries in regards to the strong industries. So you have very, how can I put it this way? You have a very uh, powerful intelligentsia in Sweden in regards to engineering, economics. They're very good, very productive people. I, I, oh, I, yeah. I'm going to do that. And uh, however, I believe that and, and when you speak to Norwegian and when you speak to Danes, well, they say, oh, the Swedes, they have not had a war in over 200 years. And they were always so neutral when it came to the foreign policy discourse. However, this, the, the Danes and the Norwegians, they say, oh, you know, we were we experienced the Second World War. We put up a fierce resistance against the evil Nazis. Uh-huh. <laughs> So you have it that mentality too. So it is, uh, and, and 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 especially if you look at the youngsters and so on, they're very pacified. They're very, how can I put it this way? They very pacified. They're very, they they are not protective of their homeland, of of their women and so on. So and it presents a golden opportunity for these men are refugees that maybe have experienced trauma, war, and everything like that, to just simply come in and take over the country. And we see this because, for instance, when I grew up, Sweden had virtually very low, I would say, criminality. Now we have these, you know, people from other corners of the world, and they bring in, you know, high crime. So we have lots of murders, shootings, and stabbings and stuff like that. So it has become a very violent and turbulent society in the sense as well. This is this is my my observation is basically the same as yours. Uh, the thing is that uh, contact in one of the groups. I won't mention names, of course, but he's, he's from non-Swedish extraction living in, in Sweden, told me that there were groups of basically Arab gangsters shooting young Swedes, including recently. And I was... Shooting, but if you look at the, for instance, harassment, if you look at the... Because you have to understand, this is the issue. Like, for instance, what I noticed living in a middle class neighborhood and so on when i see these youngsters grow up and so on they're kind of very spoiled you know um very well mannered you know brought up for instance by their parents to not use force to act civil you have a very high trust society this is something that i'm going to give this week for instance in the past if you lose money in the street or your credit card Someone might take your credit card and they will identify you and call you up and say, look, Mr. or Mrs., we have your credit card. You can go and pick it up. And this is something that we used to call, uh, you know, a high trust society. And this is something Mm -hmm. so, so beautiful. And for instance, my parents told me, like, when they lived in Sweden, you can have your door open. You can go out to the park. Nothing will ever happen to you. There are a few cases of alcoholism and so on, but no problems. But nowadays, you might get robbed, you might get attacked, and several females might, you know, end up in trouble when they enter a relationship with these mena guys. Mm-hmm. So, and and this is also, so so I see this society, you know, crumbling into pieces. The only thing that sustains Sweden is that it has a very good economy in comparison to other countries, naturally. However, the welfare state, you know, is is also draining the society. So if we experience another economic collapse and these MENA refugees don't get their social benefits and so on, what will happen then? (laughs) I... yeah, I, 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 I mean, well, looking what what is the dynamic of population? Uh, how is the birth rates of the invaders? Oh, very. Strong. I think five, six kids per family. 
five, six kings. And what is the situation with um, mixed families with with these uh, with these uh, foreigners? Yeah, this is this is you brought up a very interesting topic. Now, what I want to bring here, I have noticed this pattern in particular in Sweden, and especially I'm going to say this is that the previous generation let's say the boomer generation, they were very, let's say that they want to marry within their, you know, certain tribe and so on. But I noticed especially that the females, they are very much open-minded for these uh, men or guys to, to enter a relationship with, especially the younger girls. We see this a lot. Mm-hmm. Girls, maybe they are 25, 30 years old, maybe younger than that as well. You see them a lot entering relationship, not only flirting or having some kind of a one night stand or something like that, but actually enter a relationship with these people. So this will also have a huge effect on, on, on let's say, uh, the ethnic component of the society. We're not there yet, but you see it a lot, especially in the metropolitan cities and so on. Yeah. So the thing is that there are two elements. First of all, is the propaganda from the special people, right? The, that are trying to present the the these invaders like some kind of exotic, like interesting, like like exciting, and also the product of this this relationship, like very beautiful, like superior and things like that. And of course, there is a natural component. Of course, um, if you have uh, men that are very polite and civilized and very too civilized for their own good, they, these these will end with uh, uh, the females will lose interest in, the, in such men at some point. Now. Because the men, one of the one of the roles of the man is a protector of a family and also being explorer, a warrior. These 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 things that are suppressed by the, by the modern society. And this completely. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but exactly like you said, this warrior mentality: protect your family, protect the closest around you, being a provider. You know. If we look at, you know, historically speaking, you provide for your family and so on. However, the problem is that what happens when you have a young generation of men that are totally cockified? Yes. You know, yes. So, so we have two, two, we have two sides of, of, of this corner, of this equation, sorry. But, and, and this is very worrisome. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so, so uh, this is, uh, I would say, another advantage of the Balkans that these things, like, uh, you know, when I say Heidut or Heiduk, you know what I mean. I mean, this is a kind of traditional thing on the Balkans, like this, this, uh, how to say it, like these groups of bandits or uh, call them as we want that were. Uh, fighting the invaders and things like that. And this in, in the border world is just like that. These people that were part of the border patrols, yes, they were patriots, but also, uh, honestly, I'm I'm pretty honest uh, how I, I was in contact. Uh, these people, a lot of them were just, um, let's say, low-tier criminals. Let's be honest yeah. here. But they went there not only to... to scam people to they really were concerned they really were concerned uh, about the what is going on and that these people will invite them but honestly honestly uh, one of the groups and this this became the the, the problem one of the groups the first group that uh, uh, was on the border they uh, kicked a little bit um, several Arabs, let's say, and one of the guys had uh, this idea to to take something from the Arabs, and they found out that uh, the Arabs actually are quite wealthy, for for their understanding, and they're coming quite well prepared in Europe, including with guns, including with weapons, including physically well prepared, including uh, uh, financially well prepared. Uh, they were uh, traveling with good. Um, good amount of money and with a lot of uh, 
the newest iPhones and laptops, things like exactly. that. Exactly. And, and I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so basically, so basically, one of the guys had this. Now you can say that it's a criminal, and he was criminal. And I'm also honest. So he had this idea that basically, if they arrested and they at first they practiced the so-called civil arrest, there is something in the constitution of Bulgaria that allows uh, basically to arrest, like being a, a civil citizen, to arrest uh, a criminal and being uh, a people that are uh, illegally invading uh, our borders, uh, criminals basically. So they used the term civil arrest. They arrested them. Of course, the Arabs or Syrians or Afghanis or whatever. They were not only Syrians at that point. Uh, they they were resisting, uh, including mm -hmm. with knives, including with guns. There was a case uh, 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 these uh, Afghani or Syrian or whatever took a gun and shot against one of the our guys. Mm -hmm. And these guys decided that. Well, they they beat the the shit out of them, and mm -hmm. they took the money and what they have because this was the 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 only way. At least this is the excuse for the the guy the guy that I I've asked him why why do you are doing that. This is the only way to stop them entering Bulgaria and Europe, because yeah. no no money means that they cannot pay for the for the channels human trafficking channels that they're using. To, to be transported further. So this this I mean this is like, like, like you said, you, you have experienced it, you have seen it and so on with your very own eyes. Now yeah. what what is shocking for me is if you look at the footages, you know, these caravans, and you see like ninety five percent of them younger male and military aged military aged men. You know, in their younger, you don't see like women and children and families and so on to, to to the same extent. Nevertheless, what shocks me the most is you look at from the perspective of the normie guy or the normie family. Oh, we are simply going to have to take them in because they're fleeing a war-torn country. <laughs> 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 you know? and, and the father is sitting. <laughs> You know, and this is, I, I think this is an issue too, for instance, like, I, for instance, I, for, let, let's put it like this. I have kids too, and, and they have, it's with a Swedish woman. So, so my kids, they have inherited this Croatian background and also the Swedish background. And I always try to tell them, you have to be proud of the Nordic heritage. You have to be proud of Sweden, you know, don't, don't and, and also be aware of certain, have certain instincts, you know, what's happening around you. The society is not the same when I grew up, my generation. Like, for instance, I just, I'm, I just turned 40 recently, for instance. So it's not the same you know, landscape as it was when I was a child and could be naive and run around and do whatever I want. But I don't see this, you know, connection with the fathers and their kids. You usually see, for instance, the mother, you know, being very liberal, being very open-minded, not talking about what can happen until it happens and then it's already too late. <laughs> you understand? And so... I just see it as a society in trouble. But but honestly, I don't think that this is particularly reserved for the Swedes. I have been, for instance, in the UK on several times. I used to work there. So I saw, for instance, I was in London, I was in Brighton, I was in Leeds, and I saw the same pattern there. For instance, it's not uncommon that you see younger British girls, you know, being with Pakistani guys and so on, entering a relationship with them, and they're so naive. And then when something happens, well, then they get into trouble. It's quite amazing. And now, first of all, these invaders, let's call them with their names, uh, they knowingly or unknowingly, most, most cases knowingly, they're coming like invaders. Why? Sure. Lord, they, they, 
Arab they, and everything like that. Yeah. They instinctively, they they in 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 no cases they in the same IQ level like the indigenous European population, and there are many reasons for that: genetical, social, cultural, whatever. But they knowingly and instinctively they know that they're going in societies that uh, the men are not well organized and they are not warriors we was this or at least the western europeans was this warrior spirit here on the balkans the even though the propaganda uh, is growing it's growing stronger to spread this degeneracy their their natural instincts among the people and and there was some resistance amongst them I told you that basically this is this is one of the things that that the invaders did. So I was in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, in 2014, and there were a lot of of of, of racial invaders, racial strangers on the street, like mm-hmm. uh, like Africans and uh, Middle Easterners. And they decided that this was even before the uh, the invasion of 2015-16. And they basically built refugee camps for, for these invaders. And the invaders, being very thankful people, they started to attack uh, Bulgarian women on the streets. Interestingly enough, not to rape them, but to kill them. There was uh, stabbings. Oh, stabbings. that's very shocked that they did not try to rape them because they usually always try to do that. Maybe, maybe, but but uh, the the more famous cases were of stabbing. So I oh, okay. there was a so, there was a, right. a, a a death case and one other girl uh, suffered uh, uh, quite severe injuries. Oh. The response the response of that was. Almost immediately, uh, the different hooligans of the football clubs, even though they don't like each other, you know, this football competition and things like that, they alight and they attacked the the refugees. So, basically, there was uh, basically these uh, these, uh, camps of the refugees were burnt down and there was uh, several... uh, death cases amongst the the immigrants so basically sure. there was a groups of people that were hunting down these these refugees on the street and, and this force a, yeah and that's a direct consequence of of, of the politics that yeah. our elites are pursuing so they are culpable for this 100 percent for everything that's going on especially this turmoil uh, i yes. mean yeah yeah so so this this force the politicians and my suspicion is that our Bulgarian politicians being corrupt, the descendants of the communists and things like that, they also don't like these refugees. They are not brainwashed to, to, to such extent like these Western Europeans, but they are accepting the refugees because this is the narrative from Europe and they are doing this for money. Of this course. Is my, my, my suggestion. But they were forced by these uh, resistance to move the the refugee camps out of Sofia, at least most of them oh. out of Sofia, and they send them to the to the Muslim part of Bulgaria, basically next to the border with Turkey, which of course didn't remove the problem because recently there was attacks from these refugee camps to the local population that were being Muslim and non-white. Uh, but these people, they also protested against the against the refugees. Called them, the, uh, basically, there were there were uh, people with with uh, with posters, with uh, with texts like "The Arabs are not human," <laughs> which oh. which which can uh, represent what is a, what what exactly are these people? Not to mention that they were. Uh, I remember that there were cases of uh, in these camps of, of, of some Afghanis raping uh, kids, basically Syrian kids and things like that. Terrible, terrible. Yeah, uh, I mean we don't know. I mean, and, and the same pattern, like you said, 
we saw these frictions in Greece too, you know, having huge, huge problems when these beautiful islands of Greece were simply, you know, turned into refugee camps, you know, and and the local population described the problem too. But I'm going to give you an example, two stories that I heard that is quite interesting. For instance, now they're trying to push through the Balkans in from Bosnia and Herzegovina into the into the Western Europe. Mm-hmm. And I heard also that it has caused huge turmoil. The Bosnian women are they're being frightened, you know. So this is we were talking about, and I want to re-emphasize this. We're talking about people with high violent capital, you know. They're not these, you know frightened people traumatized from the war running away you know seeking shelter or being hunted by the Taliban we're talking about very aggressive and violent people you know in these camps so I think this should be an eye-opener for every European tuning into this show that this is a huge problem you know something that shouldn't be yeah go ahead so to to give a little bit of points to the to, to the people that thinks that only the difference in culture are the problem. Uh, to be honest, most of the people that are invaders are, are quite uh, aggressive are Muslims. Now this is this is a fact. But also there was uh, some uh, Christians, especially from Syria, right? Uh, they, from what I can get, they're less aggressive and they're causing less trouble. But still, there was trouble, of course, because they're, they're just foreign, for uh, racially, including and culturally and linguistically, whatever foreign elements. Now, uh, these people that are coming, they they're following uh, Islam. And Islam is a warrior religion. It's a warrior culture. It's Semitic culture. And it serves, basically, they are looking at us as kafirs, like these unbelievers, these infidels that must be conquered, that they, that they must be turned into Islam. Mm-hmm. Now, the Christianity, what the Christianity are doing, basically, meanwhile, the Pope is washing the, the legs of the... <laughs> no, he's, he's washing the feet and kissing the feet of the Syrians. Yeah. <laughs> and the pa- patriarch churches, patriarch churches, they're just, they're reserved. They're, they're not saying anything. And they won't say anything because the patri- patriarch churches, they're uh, just a uh, tool of the state. So if the, the state is more uh, nationalistic, the church will become more nationalistic. If the, the state is more, is communist, the, the churches will become communist and so on and so on. They are just product of the state. This is the thing. And in northern part of Europe, the Protestants from what I can get, they're totally without any kind of support from the churches. Oh uh, No, they're for alphabet people, you know, LGBTQ and stuff like that, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and there you have it from all of these Christian camps, like you just mentioned. One is state control from Moscow. The other one yeah. is, you know, acting in a cosmopolitan way. I don't know what this Pope is doing. Some people say that he is that he is very inclined toward Bolshevism. And so on. I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't be surprised. And then you have on the other side, this Lutheran that is very, you know, liberal in the sense and adopting everything what we hear in the mainstream media. So the Christian camps are not really, uh, let's say, Christianity. I don't see a revival of Christianity really as a leverage against this horrifying trend that we're experiencing. What we need is, like you touched on earlier, uh, solid grassroots movements that is uh, ethnically conscious, and very, you know, uh, protective, like you said, of the homeland, of the family, of its people, and so on. I think this is something that we need much more. However, by the way, you have followed these recent events, what happened, 
now the ongoing discussion is that within three weeks that the Taliban will take over Afghanistan. You follow that event? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So now we hear an outcry from the media that, oh, you know, so we were in a process that we were going to deport these Afghanis that commit these violent crimes. (laughs) <laughs> but now we cannot do that due to security reasons. So these Afghanis that came to, to Western Europe, well, they will be forced to stay here for quite a long time due to the turmoil over there. However, this went a little bit further than that. They said, oh, now we're going to have to open up and take in more refugees. So we see history repeating itself again. So, it is interesting. First of all, I'll make very short analysis of of the Americans in Afghanistan. Americans in Afghanistan basically made the same mistake like, let's say, 200 years ago, the British Empire did in Afghanistan. So basically, the the Brits believed that they uh, conquered and pacified Afghanistan, and they pulled out the troops out of Afghanistan to India. And then what was left from the British troops and the uh, Sikhs uh, was watered by the Afghanis because they are totally, back in the time, they were very unruly people because they're hodgepodge of different ethnics and super racial, racial types and even uh, religious and so on and so on. And the Americans even though they're kind of spiritual and genetic descendants of the uh, British Empire, they somehow forgot about this. And they decided to pull out the troops and to basically leave Afghanistan to to the Taliban, which to large extent the creation of the same Americans with the CIA and things like that. Maybe, this is my speculation because I didn't mention one of the, the, the... the the aspects of the of the uh, Middle Eastern and African invasion in Europe. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe uh, the Russians and the Chinese and the forces behind them, the special people, of course, uh, the uh, they are pulling the same trick to the Americans like the Americans did to the Soviets back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Just my opinion, because um, these crises, these people that 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 uh, uh, entered uh, uh, Europe in 2016, first of all, they were not not the first non. Europeans in Europe at that time. You know that in Germany there are large uh, uh, Gastabite uh, community of Turks. Uh, yeah. the, in France, they had the basically France became colonies of their colonies in Portugal. Uh, in, yeah, Algeria. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is nothing new. They, these these invaders are just new wave of of of, of non-Europeans that are coming. And they, in many cases, had problems with the older waves, uh, older settled non-Europeans. And interestingly enough, in France, from what I can uh, uh, find from different sources, in France, you have uh, almost five generations, five generations after the First World War, there was a resettling of some Africans there. Five generations of of, of uh, non-Europeans, mm. five generations, and these people are not integrated. Well, yeah, exactly, they're not assimilated. One hundred years, France is quite a rich country with uh, mm. quite a powerful culture. Uh, basically, the second, at least from Europe, uh, from the European superpowers, it was the second most powerful okay. superpower. Yeah, I don't want to cut you off, but during the De Gaulle era, Charles De Gaulle, they were also fear pushing for this assimilation hard as heck, you know, to mm. make people assimilate, to become a Frenchman. And despite all of these great lengths that they went through, they have not able to assimilate these people. So that gives you an indication what you just said, yeah. So, so, so for 100 years, you have this, this thing in France, and then... 
the real French uh, men that are descendants of Romans and Gauls, uh, yeah. they, they they don't they they feel uh, feel feel uh, repressed in their own country. And uh, uh, these, these uh, what uh, Sarkozy was uh, to- told back in the time, the Sarkozy, the special, the special guy, uh, he said that it will be, what was exactly his speech that will be, uh, they will be forced to to integrate, they will be forced to mix with these people, and otherwise it will be a crime. So this was uh, obviously uh, uh, obviously this this uh, cause awakening with a lot of people and I honestly from my my side I, I was expecting something to happen to Germany but the Frenchmen are the people that are rebelling against this yeah. and, and I so, think uh, sorry, I, I, you know, go, 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 go ahead. Yeah, the French are rebelling uh, very much. I see this too, and there are different phases that I that I would like to outline. But go ahead, you first. What you saw? Yeah. Well, well, the the thing is that uh, well, France is the second power in in the European Union, especially right now after the uh, Brexit, and. Uh, if France decides to, to change their policy to more, um, how to say, ethnically, uh, na- ethnic nationalism, this will this will affect the European Union. And and I don't think that France could be this uniting power in the European Union. I was expecting. Germany, honestly, because uh, but on the other hand, Germany they are still more or less uh, ethnically German, more or less, even though the the numbers of the non-Germans are rising. But in France, they on the it looks like they are at the breaking point of society. Yes, they are on the verge of a collapse, and there are yeah, I'd like to say. One thing that you just mentioned is that I would even go th- further than that, that the European Union, it was conceived by this alliance between France and Germany. You know, you know, even because those two states are the core states of the European Union, definitely France and Germany. Now, what happened here is that we have noticed very strong protest. For instance, you had this uprising Yellow Vest movement that really disrupted the, the, the French elite. You know, you had these grassroots movement going out against the Macron government. Pr- prior to this, you had a, a string of terrorist attacks that hit France very hard. I would say with the Bataclan massacre in 2050, was very well coordinated and caused, you know, it was, it, it took place on different areas and so on. It was very, and you had more of these attacks too. And also this issue, this statement that was issued by these French generals that, look, our society is in a total decay. We have huge problem with these migrants and so on, and it's boiling something. So something is definitely happening in France, I would say. I agree here too. What uh, do you think of of the statements that behind these terrorist attacks? Because uh, analyzing the previous terrorist groups, there are always some secret intelligence service behind them. Like you think, you think that they are like yeah. I heard this so many times that often you know people say oh these are false flags attacks you know and. Is is that what you're hinting on, or a little bit? Not exactly. I think that they're real attacks, but they were organized by uh, foreign intelligence that are against the European Union, even though the European Union is basically committing a self, basically suicide or or, or, or murder of the European people. It could be. It could be at least to a certain extent that they, it could be, I have not dwelled into this. I had actually an, um, 
an interview when I started my YouTube channel with a man called Christopher Bowlin, and you're familiar with his yeah. work, or? Yeah, yeah, I know his work. Yeah, and what is interested with Mr. Bolin is that virtually every <laughs> every attack of this kind that happens, he usually say that it's a false flag in order to uh, widen this war on terror and so on. I just simply don't buy that, you know, like like he says. I think it, that I think that because you see, basically, I had this idea. First of all, I don't think that these people. We established that that they are very aggressive. They come with a very different mindset. They're different race, different culture, different religion. And they're coming like like uh, conquerors. Conquerors are also conquering women. Conquering, exactly. Uh, and but but uh, they're not very well organized now. It is established fact, even though it's it's uh, covered by the official media, that these people that uh, attacked the women at the uh, in Germany at the New Eve's na- night, I'm I believe, it was, in Cologne, in Cologne, yeah, in Cologne, in Cologne. yeah, in, in <laughs> Cologne, uh, they were organized by the uh, mosque. Now, could who, be yes. That, 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 that wouldn't surprise me because it was on a, such a large scale. Scale. It was not one or two isolated events. Even the mainstream media in, in picked this up. So definitely it was a severe. Do you remember what Russian today was reporting at that point? There were... no, I, no, I don't, but I would please enlighten me on this. Uh... The Russians today were claiming enormous uh, amount of attacks. Basically, the Russian they claimed that several uh, that basically a Russian girl was kidnapped uh, during the, the the day and ganged rape by a group of Arabs. So basically, she was missing for 30 minutes, and today they announced that she was kidnapped by a group of uh, of Arabs. So this this became a uh, fake news. Basically, mm-hmm. it was proven that is fake news. Then they claimed that a bunch of Russians were defeating and beating the Arabs in the middle of um, Berlin. This was also fake news. So they're spreading this disinformation for some yeah. for some reason. And at the other hand, I started to think what was the connection between the uh, or how established are the uh, the connections of the Russians in the Middle East? Well, they're quite strong positions in the Middle East since the time of the communist USSR. They, you well, know that connections with uh, with Gaddafi. They have connections with, uh, for instance, Saddam Hussein's Iraq. They have vested interests also in Afghanistan for a very long time. I believe, for instance, now I don't want to jump into geopolitics to cut you off, but I believe, for instance, that the Russians gladly wanted the U.S. to be stuck in a war in Afghanistan for so many years. I think yes. that that coincided with their interests. Yes. I mean, definitely, because they're doing the dirty work, what the neocons were not able to do, you know, in the past. So, so yeah. Exactly. So basically, what I was thinking uh, was that uh, from my side on the border with with uh, Turkey. So basically, the terrain between Turkey and Bulgaria is quite tricky. It's a it's a low mountain covered with with forests next to the sea. And there are a lot of small rivers, and it's not easy terrain. It's 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 a very tricky terrain to pass through to that terrain. So my suspicion was that these people uh, with relatively large sums of money, uh, well prepared, including physically well prepared, very aggressive, they very, yeah. They were led by someone in Bulgaria. So my suspicions at first were the Turkish secret service because Turkey is a very centralized, almost almost fascistic state for the Turks. Maybe it's better for the state to be organized like that. And they 
they uh, generally wouldn't allow these invaders that are not white in Turkey to have weapons. But these invaders came with weapons. So who allowed these people to come uh, uh, with weapons and so good sums of money? Most likely the Turks. So also we heard this rumor that uh, uh, the guides of, of these uh, human trafficking that uh, are helping these refugees are members of the Grey Wolves. And Grey Wolf is this Turkish supposedly fascistic organization. Uh, this is the official uh, narrative that they are fascist, Turkey, Turkish fascist. And the Grey Wolves are helping these refugees to enter Europe. So why is that? At the other hand, there was uh, in, uh, info that uh, Islamic State, uh, more than 20% of the Islamic State, I believe it was even 25% of the Islamic State, are citizens of the Russian uh, uh, confederation, and this is coming from the Russian media. So, if you have more than one quarter of the of the members of uh, these terrorist organizations, uh, 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 mm, citizens of the Russian confederation, it is very easy to infiltrate agents there. Sure. And of course, these terror attacks, very well organized, very well synchronized, uh, hitting a political message. Uh, these attacks in Bulgaria, this boiled opinion in favor of several nationalistic organizations, kosher nationalists or civic nationalists. Uh, this coincided with the election of Trump. This coincided with a lot of a lot of uh, things going on at that time. Yeah, but I, I I heard that too. And when I spoke to Christopher Moulin, for instance, he told me that, you know, there are good indications suggesting that all of these attacks, you know, committed by Muslims are done by, you know, behind every attack you have like some, you know, Mossad work behind it. However, what what, what is interesting with this, narrative is that whenever a Muslim terrorist, you know, at, you know whenever we have a Muslim terrorist, in, in, for instance, we had it in Sweden, in Stockholm, we had it in, in Germany, we had it in, for instance, in UK, in France and so on, almost every time the media says, oh, you know, it's a lone wolf attack, <laughs> This, this this man was not a Muslim. He was, you know, it, he, he acted completely by his own. There is no big network behind it, you know. So it's just a maniac. That's usually the media narrative. However, if someone who is inclined a little bit nationalistic, well, then it's a grand conspiracy behind it. All, everyone is connected, you know, from from the... Top to blow, you know, it's, so so it becomes so weird. And Christopher Bolin's uh, main argument was that, oh, you know, we they want to extend this war on terror so we can continue forever. I just simply don't see it like that. However, I'm more leaning towards your side, what you said, because I agree with you here. There was a, so many of these ISIL, ISIS fighters, or whatever you want to call them, a huge, I mean, 25% is a lot from these, you know, Central Asian countries, or even that there were citizens, you know, in the Russian Federation, you know, from Chechnya, Dagestan, and stuff like that. So it is, it, it, it could possibly, be, but, but I'm leading more towards your side that they were coordinated in some sense, but I, I just don't buy it that it is to extend this war on terror. A any thoughts on this? Mm, absolutely, I don't think. First of all, the American foreign, I don't know what is going on with CIA, CIA and the American intelligence, but it, what kind of people are working them? I mean, they are failing, at least what we what we can see. They are failing on so many occasions these days. 
Meanwhile, nobody is talking about the Russians, so the only people that are talking uh, are just these liberals, and they cannot criticize the Russians on the basis of their democracy because these models that this model that they are presenting to the people is not working. Multiculturalism is not working. That's why a lot of people are attracted to this fake traditionalism that the Russians are presenting. Exactly. But and, Russia itself, like you and I have discussed, if you look at the you know, ethnic landscape in Russia, it is a highly diversified society too. You know, if you look at the borders, for instance, between Russia and the Central Asian republics, they have remained wide open since 1991, and the Russian birth rates are in heavily decline. Absolutely. You know? so, so if you look at, and also if you look at Islam, it has become a component integrated into this scheme of a greater Russia. Um, especially I'm referring to Chechnya and Dagestan and so on. In the past, they had these scuffles, these wars and so on. But nowadays, all of a sudden, you have Chechen mercenaries running the errands of the FSB, which is quite insane, you know. So, I mean, I just see Russia as a highly diversified society, heavily influenced by Zionism too. So I simply don't understand, you know, they these old rightists like you and I have discussed in the past, they they are leaning more towards Russia because Russia is a traditional society. Well, if you use that argument, I can say that I like Saudi Arabia because it's a traditional society as well. <laughs> and it's so stupid. This is know? this is well said. This is this is this is well said, brother. Uh well Look, uh, basically, the most of the people that are uh, talking about Russia and uh, like this fourth political theory and this Eurasianism that they're talking about Dugin, but Dugin, Dugin is, I will say that he's agent of influence. He's a philosopher. He's also uh, he's also occultist. So very. Very interesting figure, but he's not the the man that created this theory. The this he's just a, a esoteric, so to say, proponent of this theory. The guy that created the theory is Evgeny Primakov. Mm -hmm. There was a, this, uh, his real name, his real family name is Finkelstein, so he's from the special people, obviously. Yeah. And he was the head of KGB and foreign minister, and he's, uh, uh, he studied, I believe, in the Moscow University. Uh, uh, the, uh, he was specialized in the Middle East, maybe because his origin is from, from the Middle East. And and uh, his doctrine is basically for this multipolar world that Dugin is talking about. Uh, the thing is that this multipolar world is basically just a cover for the real uh, goal of Russia to dominate the world, right? Yes. Uh, and basically, there one of their pillars is. Uh, a strong influence in the Middle East. They uh, they think that uh, in the Middle East, according to the Prima, Prima Kors doctrine, uh, the Middle East is very important for the Russian uh, uh, for Russian how say go, geopolitical influence. First of all, because of course there are a lot of logistical um, how to say paths coming from the Middle East. Second sure. of all, uh, second of all, of course, there are cultural reference. There will be always cultural reference according to this doctrine. Uh, the Russians will claim that they are protecting the Christians and the Holy Lands, which exactly. of course they played this card in the 19th century with the Crimea War. Uh, they were they claimed that the Russians must be protector of all uh, uh, Christian sites or at least Orthodox Christian sites in the in the uh, so-called Holy Land and so on and so. So they're playing this this narrative, and a lot of people are. Uh, embracing Russia, 
uh, feeling that they could rely on Russia against this globalistic influence of the uh, of America and uh, Western Europe. Uh, and and this is uh, we're talking uh, like Europeans. This is a problem of Europe. We embraced a lot of the these globalist narrative from the uh, America uh, from the American government, and the American government had totally different geopolitical goals than Europe. This is this is the, this is a thing. The American government actually had different geopolitical goals than uh, the the larger por- portions of the white population in Europe, and this was shown oh. through the elections. So the American government don't care about the the founding population of America. American government also don't like independent Europe. And this influenced the policy of Europe. Instead of Europe defending the borders, creating uh, uh, good relations with certain states that could uh, prevent eventual uh, invasion uh, in Europe, like, for example, why Europeans were supporting the uh, destruction of uh, Qaddafi's regime, for example. Uh, this is very strange for me because basically he said he was here and there, of course, he was not exactly our friend and things like that, but he he said he that was friend. Yes. He 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 basically he was, he basically, managing, he was managing at least the borders because yeah, if yeah. it is North African country it exactly. became just a route, a route in for these migrants from Western Africa to enter immediately when Gaddafi was toppled. Yes. Just like you. So, so, so why we why the Europeans are doing that? This is this presents how how uh, how we don't have any kind of of, of unified uh, ethnically based. Maybe this is the problem that we don't have ethnically based uh, geopolitical doctrine, because of course the, the geopolitics must include the knowledge of the history and must include also the knowledge of the ethnic uh, the uh, the uh, ethnoses or people or nations or races that inhabited a, a certain land. So, and- yeah, that's a very good point that you brought up. However, the problem is that we have seen, historically speaking, when it comes to the tenets of geopolitics, is that usually they are reserved for the bigger power you are, the more leverage you have in global politics. So, 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 so we see a clash of, I would say, empire states more than tiny nation states looking after their own interests because they're automatically absorbed into the interest of the greater powers, just like European Union. You, you mentioned there is no, let's say, autonomy in, in when it comes to a geopolitical doctrine. So you just immediately follow what Uncle Sam does. Yeah, in that sense. I agree. In in that sense, I will... Now, I'm following... There are different uh, channels that uh, you can find, quite obscure channels. For example, I was watching a channel called Pan-Europeanism. Now, you know that I'm against all kinds of Pan-everything, pan Swavism and Pan-everything, yeah. including Pan-Europeanism. But I could agree on some of the points that this channel was making. One of the points is, was that... Uh, why do you need European Union? And generally speaking, he said that in the future uh, you have these um, mastodons, these basically empires like the United States, like like China, like right. Russia, like the yes. alliance between China and Russia. And you must somehow manage to negate their economical, military, and political, geostrategical influence. So Russia, uh, so basically Bulgaria alone and Croatia alone, and even Bulgaria, Croatia, Germany won't be enough to to negate Russia, obviously. But maybe Europe, 
maybe Europe as a whole will manage to balance Russia. I agree with that. Uh, then, Perhaps. then we share more or less uh, economy. I agree with that. The problem with the European Union is that it's created like anti-European union, and by yeah. anti-European, I mean this. Uh, couldn't have Kalergi that stated that the future of the European race is basically mongrel race, similar to the to the uh, race of ancient Egypt. Exactly, exactly. And and here is the problem. And I think you and I have touched on this too. I believe that that due to the fact that the Germany is stripped off of its political power and only acting as an economic engine to serve the economic interests of the rest of the European states, it, it needs to somehow gain political power again, although we are miles away from this happening now. But that would be the most ideal situation, that Germany could reassert itself as a regional power that has the leverage to, to, to really balance other great powers. But I don't see that yet happening for a long time. Unfortunately, this is part of the things that that we must uh, discuss. Basically, we all know that Europe cannot be real Europe without real Germany. Is this, uh, I agree. On many levels, on, on industrial level, social, cultural, even esoterically speaking, because it's the heart of Europe in in. All, all, uh, all meaning of that word. Unfortunately, only, sorry, I don't mean to cut. Not only that, but the entire legal framework for how we are conducting, let's say, international affairs is based on Germany being as a pacified economic entity, nothing more, nothing less. You know, and this needs to radically change. So we can create a better landscape, especially in regards to the the geopolitic the geopolitical future of Europe itself, like you said. Yeah. yeah uh, unfortunately, the, the the Germans, the Germans, they don't want to lead anymore. They are walking the spirit, not to the same extent like the Swedes, for example, but they are walking the spirit of their forefathers. They, they they are afraid to to repeat what their forefathers did because of the of these ghosts of the Holocaust. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the the plague from this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so so basically so basically the whole world is cheering for Germany. The whole Europe is 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 hoping Germany to revive spiritually, culturally. They don't want. They don't want to lead Europe. Uh, at least in the real sense of the of the world lead. So I hope that this will change. But uh, on the on the basis of of the present situation, my uh, idea is that we, Europe, if Europe wants to survive and the Europeans want to survive, we must create alliances like local alliances. Let's say between Bulgaria and Croatia. Maybe between Bulgaria, Croatia, Albania. Maybe between Bulgaria, yeah. Romania, Croatia, and so on and so. On. So this this must negate the influence of certain powers like Turkey, Russia, and um, the pro-Russian states on the Balkan. <coughs> yeah, exactly. We know that state. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and like you said, and 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 these are so. So look, if, if we look at the geopolitical challenges that are facing us, also we noticed, like you said, and this is very good to highlight, we have certain groups acting to push in these migrants. We have possibly maybe other states, you know, pushing for this too to create more turmoil. You know, so so basically what we need is a transformation of the of the geo, ge, geopolitical, you know, activities. And also to reaffirm our borders, because now when everything is cracking, if you look at the challenges that we face now, more migrants pouring into Europe. That is a fact, no doubt. 
we have also this problem with the geopolitical frictions between China, Russia, and the U.S., you know, each of them striving to somehow, you know, control certain spaces and so on in the Middle East and, 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 and in Europe, for instance, that too. So we have these severe challenges. Now, the best thing is, like you said, on a, on a regional level, have a good geopolitical ties, like you mentioned, in the Balkan, because Balkans is an extremely important region region for the the great powers, and also for the migrants to enter Europe too. So yes. Also, there is another thing that I didn't mention. You know, Russia is trying to grab Germany in their uh, geopolitical orbit, so to say. Because you know that the theory is that Germany and Russia, if they unite together, they could balance the Atlantic civilization, the Atlantic uh, being the Americans and to some extent the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, if Germany is in the orbit of Russia, the whole Europe will be in the orbit of Russia. And the the influence of, of, of Russia in Germany is through the resources. Uh, you and, know about... And, uh, yeah, yeah. Nord Stream. The, yeah. Nord Stream, yeah. So this is the, the, the thing that is this uh, pr- problematic for me. So because uh, Europe depends on resources from Russia... Yes. And to some extent through Africa, we depend on Russia and from Africa. And now I'm not proponent for imperialism, but the whole point of the imperial colonies was to provide resources to the to the metropolitan. Uh, metropolitan bias like the British and French. But unfortunately, this brought... Uh, uh, large groups of, of non-Europeans to Europe. Exactly. Now, now uh, we 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 are going in direction in the future. Uh, we are going in direction of more and more, how to say, working places or, or or jobs will be replaced by robots. So we don't need these uh, uh, non-Europeans. Lady. Yeah, exactly. There is. This is a very good point that you brought up. This is a very good point. For instance, because if we follow the public discourse here in the West, they say, "Oh, you know, we have an aging populations, and we need to have, you know, someone doing the scab labor, like you said, these petty jobs that don't require much any education whatsoever." However, this is completely false. These jobs could be automated instantly. We already see this pattern happening on a high level jobs. Absolutely. So so I just don't see there is no argument whatsoever to bring in these military age men with high level of testosterone and violent capital on their, you know, to just take over society. There is absolutely no reason for this whatsoever it, there How- is a there is a reason that is not logical from the perspective of the european but it's logical from these special people from the occult circles yeah. that are that are following them yes so, but we need to we, we need to make people that they understand that they're tuning in that they don't think oh we have an aging population so we need to bring them in because they can all be uber taxi drivers <laughs> yeah yeah, not, yeah yeah sure <laughs> we don't need them because there are more and more people uh, for example uh, just to, i gave an example i believe that i gave example in the previous podcast uh, you have these robots that is self-propelled machine a genius genius of the german engineering uh, yeah. implemented this pharma pharma robot and he's re- re- replacing i believe 20 uh well qualified workers uh, from the balkans or basically gypsies most likely gypsies and and it, 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 it's not so expensive. 
And when you have these these uh, high tech uh, solutions, you don't need to to uh, to import these uh, well qualified invaders. Exactly. Now, of course, according to the propaganda, they are all engineers and doctors, but this is bullshit. Of course, <laughs> it's not true. Uh, and and uh, the only problem for 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 Europe is the resources. The problem is that the resources are coming mostly, as I said, from Russia and from Africa. So mm. we need to support, and this is geopolitical uh, decision, we need to support, for example, what was left from the white population in Africa, for example, the Boers. They, yeah. They're living in an extremely rich country that we need these resources, and it was stupid as I said, geopolitical suicide to leave these people, not to mention the, what was the moral uh, impact. I mean, to, to leave these people to the, to in the hands of their enemies, uh, mm. uh, and and to 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 what is the situation of these people right now? The murders of the of the farmers, the rapes, they're skyrocketing, and this is since the end of the apartheid. So we. The European powers must fix this mistake and help them. Uh, yeah, you see, if you look at the current climate right now, we see like do, what kind of changes do you see that might actually happen? Do you think, for instance, like because I am, I am not anymore a believer, let's say, to change politics, politics to parliamentary means. I think that one factor that might hit us, for instance, if, if it will be another lockdown or a financial collapse or maybe a greater war in the peripheries and so on, this might everything disrupt our societies and, and, and lead to maybe not a civil war, but at least some kind of a fault line tensions between the host populations and these migrants entering. I think that we are actually reaching that point how do you see any kind of changes being materialized do you, because i don't think that you believe that you can change through parliamentary means anything no anything. no no there will be there will be direct action there will be increasing non-political activities so to say i won't say any <laughs> what exactly i think but there will be a violent outbreaks there will be a ra rising tensions between these ethnic groups between the indigenous population in europe and these invaders this will bring to revolutions uh, most likely in france from what I can see, maybe in Germany, maybe in the uh, Benelux, uh, the, these countries, especially amongst the uh, these uh, in Belgium, because yeah. this is the heart of the EU. Um, on the Balkans and in Eastern Europe, I see switch to more nationalistic uh, governments. Yeah. And, and increasing pressure from the Russians, increasing pressures from these. There will be some event, I believe, in the next, maybe next 10 years, maybe more, that will bring new waves from Africa and from the Middle East. And then we'll see what will happen. Maybe until that point, we will have a formed European army. They're talking about that. Um, which of course I, I am for the European army, but I I am skeptical who will lead the army because in the present format, European Union don't have the ideological, and spiritual, so to say, uh, core to unify to the Europeans. Just this idea of liberalism and democracy, this this the, the weak ideas. It's not enough to unify the people. Uh, but but if we pre, if we create this idea of unite Europe of of mother Europa uh, this uh, this 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 place of cultural values of this and even if uh, even if uh, uh, America uh, like this is this is 
my prediction is not nothing unique. It, it looks like America will go to is going to fall in the in the next decade or so. Uh, even if America uh, is is destroyed like like a global power, Europe could survive. Yeah. But we must change the destiny of Europe of of being some kind of 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 of, of continuation of the global uh, politics of the of the special people in uh, in America and Russia to our unique way, the European way. And, and that gives us a very good indication that we must never lean towards either Washington or Moscow, that we have to embrace a full European, let's say, foreign, foreign policy identity that is separate from these two. And, and I really believe that I usually say that to people that my main interests are the, the European people's interests. That's my absolutely number one priority concern. You know, I don't, you know, focus that much what happens in the outskirts. Oh, we need to think about that. Or so, like some old writers, they, they try to find solidarity with Iran or with, you know, Arabs and so on and see them as a, Oh, we're gonna go hand in hand together and topple this Zionist machinery and so on. I just don't see that happening. Like for instance, for me, I oppose Zionism and I oppose Islam too. I'm looking primarily after the interests of the European peoples. That's my main con. That's my main priority. The rest, non-intervention and just leave it alone. And they can do what they have, whatever they want to. You know, as long as we are protecting ourselves and our borders and our peoples. Any thoughts? Hmm. Let's let's put it that way. I think that we on the Balkans will survive <laughs> one way or another. Yeah, I think we will. And and I, I think like for instance, luckily, thankfully enough, I have a place in Croatia that I can go to. And it, it's like the way I see it, these changes here happening like like you said in a 10 15 year cycle who knows what will happen here so probably eventually i will move back there i i, I mean but on the other hand of course it's sad to see this country also just fall into the wrong hands you know it, it's just very sad so i, I mean my the most ideal situation would be if we could see a real nationalistic uprising here in Sweden too. However, I don't see this civil national... Have you noticed one thing that is very special? Whenever civil nationalists gain more political power, you see, I mean, the powers that be taking more extreme measures or taking in more migrants, you know, <laughs> creating more chaos, you know, and preying on fear. Oh, look at these. We have these evil Nazis in power. Hence, we have to create a much more, you know, open society for the migrants to feel more welcome. <laughs> it's yeah. It, 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 we have reached a dead end with these Zivnaz, I think, you know, that, that, that would be my conclusion. Yeah, because I, and I think that the most of the people are p- uh, pissed off with, with these civic nationalism that uh, this this very vague understanding what is what is nationalism actually and uh, this is this is what uh, what is my idea um sooner or later european union will either mutate uh, or turn into more nationalistic union of of people or will be destroyed. Now, destruction of the European Union is not a good idea because this will basically open the, the gates of fortress sure. Europa to the for the Russians, Turks, and even Chinese, I would tell. Uh, and not to mention these uh, waves of invaders that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, in the present, in the present, uh, uh, the present political situation, European Union is is oppressive, quasi-communist state. Mm. And it's and, not sustainable. Like you said, it's it's not. 
it's not sustainable, you know, these policies that are being conducted now. It's oh, working against the very interest of the European people, from Brussels, I mean. Uh, what, uh, you you know that in the European Union they have standardization for everything except the humans that are entering the European Union. Okay. They 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 are restricting more uh, the the population of the Balkans that are ethnically European since thousands of years than these Afghani, Pakistani, and African invaders. So basically, how how these political union have a, a wall for standardization of the sizes of the cucumbers. Size and shape of the cucumbers in the European Union <laughs> are standardized, but not the humans that are invading us. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so it is mind blowing how they, 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 I mean, we know why is that. We know what is the Esoteric, but we cannot uh, talk about this on on YouTube. But <laughs> it's it's a everyone must find their own research and make their own research and and find uh, their own people source. To, you know, and we encourage it. Keep an open mind. Look for your own. Check what we're saying. You know, because like it's it's so easy to find it information if you just have an open mind and yeah not be, yeah that, that's the thing and not and the next stage is to 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 start to organize locally like I people th that you know personally people that you trust um uh, people that you can you can trust your wife and family this is very important also and uh, these kind of people uh, will become the core of, of future nationalism. This is what, what I see. Um, and, and it's very important that we reach out to these younger people as well, yeah. because they're the core of this civilization. I usually try to do it when I get the opportunity to get to know these youngsters and so on and to have a good conversation. And, some of them are quite, you know, they, they, their consciousness of what is going on. And this is a perfect way to, so we can, you know, red pill them to a large extent. I mean, I think it's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that this is the, the, the future of Europe are these young uh, boys that are now uh, raising their their national nationalist uh, how to say consciousness their their understanding of what is european what to be nationalist what to be uh, i mean there 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 must be two different levels and this is the gradation i think so one uh, one of the levels or uh, is the nationalism like being uh, sweet or german or bulgarian or bosniak or romania or whatever and then the higher level is to be european or part of the of the the, the european race as a whole uh, yes, exactly I, I agree here I agree. That's very well said. That was a very good. And and also to network. We need to network a lot with people that are open-minded to our views, you know, that maybe have gone through certain experiences and so on, that know these things and are aware of these issues facing us. So I think networking is also the key. And to stay in touch as one, I... Um, I really believe so. Well, I think, I mean, we're reaching the end towards the show. And I usually ask this to my guests, you know, before we wrap things up. Um, is there anything more that you would like to, you know, point out? I mean, we have discussed quite quite a good time. But is there anything more that you would like to add to this before we wrap this up, my friend? I will say that... Your analysis, first of all, it's <laughs> totally, totally criminally underrated channel on YouTube. That's why I advise you to to switch to Odyssey and Telegram. You find a lot of people with uh, to follow your channel because 
this is what is basically the geopolitical and uh, analysis in the nationalistic sphere, so to say, I'm totally missing. There are no people that are uh, analyzing the situation and making deep analysis. And this is you 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 could you could fill this this gap with uh, your analysis. Uh, second of all, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, I hope that for the future we'll have more podcasts. Well, most definitely. That is something that I wanted to say before we wrap this up. Is that I'm keen on having you on more and more times because I feel uh, on so many levels that you and I resonate and um, I really want to get the chance also to visit you in Bulgaria uh, definitely Thank you. again and if you get the chance if you want to visit here in Sweden absolutely I could right. absolutely and, I even talk with a lady that is quite close to my heart to visit Dubrovnik at some point but uh, yeah, Dubrovnik she, could be also uh, definitely I would love to show you around in in Croatia and you can come to Sweden as one, and it's it, it because, for instance, Stockholm is. I'm gonna tell you, it is an, an amazing city too that you should see. You know, it is very very beautiful, despite the the other aspect that you and I have discussed. But it is a fantastic city and so on. And um, and actually, if you want to come here, you and I stay in touch. And of course, I want you on the show on more occasions. And Actually, I've been thinking to shifting over to alternative channels because I know that we are experiencing this uh, this kind of monitoring for what we are saying and how we are articulating ourselves and so on. And it's it, it's it's sad that we have reached this point. You know, I I, I will say that this is the this is the solution uh, right now. We don't have we don't have these for now at least these great power that could support the european nationalism and uh, actually we are against many global powers and the only thing that we can provide for now is this networking of of individuals all around the world and brainstorming looking what we can do like like maybe local businesses or maybe maybe uh creating some kind of of unified propaganda information if you want because some people had bad bad taste from the word propaganda but whatever i mean something that 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 comes from from uh, from uh, the minds of, of these uh, uh, people for example these these um, i will make a, a small advertiser for this board talk uh, you must listen to these people uh, because these they they are very <sighs> pressed to the, the next to the wall very intelligent very very typical european um logical explanation analysis of the situation and they're looking for 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 some kind of solution for them so maybe in the future we can manage to help them or maybe they could help us sure. so so these these are the only solutions that I can see. Just networking and trying to find some kind of of solutions to help each other and to uh, spread our word, so to say. Very well said. Well, look, I'm looking forward to doing more shows with you. And for anyone that is tuning in here, if you like this, make sure to hit the like button. Make sure to subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about the video. Once again, it was a pleasure having you on, and I'm looking forward to be on your show too. And I will put the link in the, the in the description so people can tune in and find us. And who knows what will happen to the channel as well. If it happens, well, naturally I will continue with this because there is definitely a higher purpose, and we need to organize ourselves, be uh, more solid, uh, share more solidarity with each other, and so on. And just not think selfishly. We need to think in the long run. Thank you once again, Nordlux, and speak to you again soon, okay? Thank you, and lekker večer. Lekker večer.